Hey folks, a little bit of a different video today, seeing that it is January and I know a lot of people out there, including myself, are trying to either drink a little bit less this month or perhaps do a full on dry January. Some people are maybe doing a little bit of a damp January where they're just trying to exercise some moderation after the holidays, which I understand. So I thought I would weigh in with some advice and opinions on the world of non-alcoholic cocktails and non-alcoholic spirits and my own personal experience with them and my own personal recipe for one. Over the last year, I've had the opportunity to dive pretty far into the world of non-alcoholic spirits and give a whole lot of them a try. I'm lucky enough to live near a really nice independently run non-alcoholic spirit shop in Brooklyn and I've tried a whole bunch of them. and. Some of them are okay. <laughs> I, I think the, yeah, for me, the main thing about non-alcoholic cocktails is an adjustment of expectations for one. You are never going to replace the alcohol burn uh, that comes in a standard cocktail. And as a result, that specific kind of heat will be missing. Certain non-alcoholic spirit manufacturers try to replace that heat with capsaicin from the heat of chilies. But what you end up getting is a, a spicy drink, not a burning drink. So I feel like if you can just go into the world of non-alcoholic cocktails and you know tell yourself that's not what I'm looking for, if what you miss during a dry January or a period of not drinking is the flavors, then there are ways to get there or close to there. I break apart the non-alcoholic spirit world into two major categories. You have your sort of base spirit alternatives, your non-alcoholic whiskeys, gins, tequilas, mezcals, rums, etc. And then you have your modifiers, your non-alcoholic aperitivos, non-alcoholic vermouths, uh, things like that. In the base spirits category, I'll be honest, I haven't found a ton of non-alcoholic drinks that I really enjoy. With one exception, I have really liked the Kentucky 74 uh, made by Spiritless. This is made by people in Kentucky who do make bourbon and they are basically starting with a bourbon base and de-alcoholizing. So you do get a lot of oaky, woody barrel notes from the Spiritless 74 that you get from a whiskey. And having this as a, just a straight up like whiskey highball, really, really chilled, nice bubbly seltzer like a Topo Chico with a big piece of ice and some Spiritless 74, you can make a whiskey soda that feels just fine. I haven't had great success with mixing the 74 into any more complex drinks. As an old fashioned, it doesn't really work, but as a whiskey and soda, as a highball, it works. I think there are far more successes in the modifier category. Your non-alcoholic bitters, non-alcoholic aperitivos, digestivos, and vermouths. I really do like the Amarno from Dr. Zero Zero which has a very strong rhubarb flavor. It's made with Chinese rhubarb and also cassia and wormwood and other botanicals. And for people that really like that strong kind of pine coney bitterness that comes from Amaro's such as Sfumato or Amaro's in the Rhubarbaro category, this really does imitate it quite well. Having a sort of spritz with a, again, a really strong bubbly seltzer like a Topo Chico or really go hard on the soda stream, add that to a glass with some ice and this and a grapefruit twist or lemon twist and you really have a nice non-alcoholic spritz. No complaints there. Other than the Dr. Zero Zero Amarno, I found a couple of other ones that I enjoy. Um, I've enjoyed the Wilderton as well as Pathfinder, which is not pictured here. With a lot of the non-alcoholic botanical forward spirits, the uh, Digestivos, Amaros, etc., they use a lot of the same flavors that Amaro makers do in the regular alcohol world. But there is a difference in how these flavors are extracted. The, the flavors do get close to what you miss in standard cocktails, but they tend to lack a little bit of strength. They are not very strong. On top of that, there's one other problem, and that's these are expensive. These bottles tend to cost at least $30 to $50 each, which is quite a bit higher than bottles that are produced in much larger quantities like the classic Maros of the world, which you can often find for, you know, starting around you know, $20 and get great selections between, you know, 20 and 40 bucks. For things like this, they are not cheap because they're made in small quantities and it's still a budding business. So 
What to do about the fact that a lot of these non-alcoholic spirits lack a little bit of strength and cost uh, way too much? Well, I have made my own and I'm gonna show you how I make it. It's really simple. The one caveat is that there is a little bit of upfront investment here, not in any fancy equipment, but just in the fact that it involves buying botanicals in bulk, which you can find easily through the Amazons of the world or ideally from a local spice shop if you have one. So yeah, that first spice purchase would affect the wallet a little bit, but if you know that you're gonna be doing dry January or that you're not gonna be drinking anymore at all and this is something you wanna pursue, for me, I found it to be more than worth it definitely cheaper than buying non-alcoholic spirits. And in the version that I've been testing out for the last year, it definitely brings back the strength of flavor that I've been missing in these other products. So here's how I make this. So I use a few terms interchangeably when trying to describe this non-alcoholic product I'm making here, because in truth, it lies somewhere between a spirit and a Maro and a premixed cocktail. Confusing terminology aside, the goal is very clear here. I'm going for a zero booze product that emulates the flavors of Negronis, Americanos, aperitif cocktails, and spritzes because these are the flavors I miss most when I'm not drinking, and they're also the flavors that we can recreate most successfully without alcohol. The process is simple. It's just a multi-stage cold extraction of various herbs and spices, also known as shoving stuff in a jar, adding water, and waiting. We've done all our spice shopping, so let's dive in. Now, a cornerstone of the classic Negroni flavor we're after is the earthy, tart, and winey taste of vermouth, which we'll get at with a base of hibiscus flowers that contain wine-like tannins. We'll also use calendula, or marigold flowers, which provide a mellow, round, earthy flavor, again building up that wine-like richness. We'll then add chincona bark, providing the quinine flavor that we taste in Campari, Aperol, and many other Italian bitters, as well as juniper berries for gin-like aromas, and gentian root, a really key flavor that appears in Campari and almost every Amaro, not to mention Angostura bitters. Next, we'll add star anise, a classic flavor in most sweet vermouths, which also often contain cassia or cinnamon bark, so we'll add that too. The final Negroni-esque flavor we then have to add is citrus, bitter orange in particular. Campari is flavored with bitter orange from the canotto tree, and we can approximate that flavor with a combination of orange notes, the foremost being dried curacao orange peels. The other orangey things we'll add later. Okay, the first and biggest round of spice time is complete. Now all we need to do is add 48 ounces of cold water, close our jar, and refrigerate for five to six days so the water can extract all these flavors. Five days later and you can see just how much color the hibiscus has imparted, which is great for getting at that deep red we want in an Americana style spritz. At this point we'll carefully strain the mixture, squeezing out all those hibiscus and calendula flowers, getting every last drop out of our cold brew extraction, and removing all the rest of our botanicals as well and straining it really well, reserving only the cinnamon bark, which still has more flavor in it to impart. We'll add that back to the jar after giving it a good rinse. Then we're going to do two more days of cold brewing, adding in a few more things. First, we're going to reinforce the subtle star anise flavor by adding just a bit more, and we'll give it another big dose of gentian root, 25 more grams as opposed to 15 on the first round, to really bring that classic Amaro flavor out, along with 5 more grams of the dry curacao orange peel. We'll then add some final accents with a few grams of pink peppercorns, which weirdly cling to the ramkin, and some cloves for punch. Those hit hard, so we only need them in there for a few days. At this point, the complex bitterness from all these roots and barks and the hibiscus is very strong. So now we get to sweeten things up a bit. To do that, we'll add some crystallized ginger, as well as some freeze-dried strawberry powder, which adds a very subtle natural sweetness and some more bright color. We'll also add the zest of one whole orange, creating a fresh citrus note that brightens up the dried curacao orange, and we'll let our batch sit in the fridge for two more days. Alrighty, it's the home stretch, and that means it's oleosaccharum time. For a more detailed look at an oleosaccharum I made using limes, here's a video for you. But this is a quick and dirty version that doesn't require as much work. All I did was peel two oranges and one lemon, weighed out the skins, and added 75% their weight in plain white sugar, tossed that mixture well, and let it sit covered overnight, allowing the sugar to pull the natural oils out of the citrus skins, creating oleosaccharum, or oil sugar. Now I'm just going to add that oleo and all the skins to my jar, along with one more dose of pulverized strawberries, mix well and let sit in the fridge one more day. Then all you have to do is strain it really well and you're ready for the most flavorful non-alcoholic spritz of your life. 
So for me, I like to go with a one to three ratio for spritzes with this particular concoction. For this Americano style presentation, I just used about two ounces of the non-alcoholic spirit and six ounces of really bubbly soda water. Waited a little bit because a lot of bubbles will form because of all the fresh botanicals in the spirit. Then I just added my large ice beer and just a little orange twist for presentation. But Yeah, it's fantastically good. Um, I prefer this sort of mock Americano to a lot of real Americanos that I've had. It's not that the taste is exactly the same as a combination of Campari, Sweet Vermouth, and Soda that you get in a real Americano, but what you do have is this incredibly strong citrus punch from three different infusions of orange. You have the dry curacao peels, you have the orange in the oleosaccharum, and then you have this last little bit of fresh orange at the very end. So it's incredibly bright and flavorful. The punch of the gentian root is so strong. And I think it's because of the fact that it has two sort of separate extractions over this week long period of cold brew. And it reminds you of Sue's. It reminds you of Angostura. It reminds you of strong gentian liqueurs. The juniper is also present and it reminds you of those Negroni flavors. I really hope you give this a try and make this spritz. It really is worth the time and it doesn't really require a lot of active preparation, just some waiting. I'll also show you one other way of enjoying this spirit, kind of inspired by the classic Garibaldi cocktail, which is a sort of equal parts drink of fresh orange juice and Campari. Seeing that we use several oranges in making the oleosaccharum that went into this drink, I thought it'd be nice to show a little non-alcoholic cocktail that made use of the insides of those oranges as well. So I've squeezed all those oranges that I peeled and made a fresh orange juice. And fresh orange juice can get really fluffy, as the bartender people say, if you take a moment to aerate it. So I'm going to dry shake this orange juice for a second. No ice, no nothing. For a little while. For me, I don't know, 30 seconds or so. Really, really try to work some air into it. And I'm just gonna give my non-alcoholic liqueur a quick little shake to combine and add one ounce to the shaken orange juice, as well as a cube of crystal clear ice for shaking, which I can show you how to make. And then we'll give this aerated orange juice and non-alcoholic liqueur a very thorough shake. As always, when I'm shaking on hard clear ice, I give it a soft sort of shake at first just to chill down the tin. And then when I see frost is formed, I hit it very hard to form a seal and then shake away. And then what we have is a really nice aerated, fluffy Garibaldi riff. Yeah, super refreshing. Really good for uh, brunch, I would recommend. And again, the juniper, the gentian root, the dry curacao, all of those botanicals are strong enough in this non-alcoholic mixture to cut through the sweetness of the orange juice and balance it out and make it bright and refreshing like a Garibaldi should be. So yeah, I hope you try the Garibaldi. I hope you try the spritz. And yeah, happy no drinking. Or less drinking. <laughs>